What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast. After a little bit of a hiatus, we are back here. Today, we're going to be discussing and recapping the 2022 Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. I'm your host, Chris Cato. And joining me today, we got one half of the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast co host, Mr. Tyler McDonald. Going to bring him in now on this little dreary Monday afternoon in Ottawa, Canada. Tyler, great to have you along today. How are you? I'm good. Great to be uh, doing a podcast again. Obviously, we uh, we weren't uh, we missed Australia, unfortunately, just the schedules didn't work for us. But uh, we're back. I think it's the first podcast we've missed in the five years we've done this. So that's a pretty wild statistic. Um, but yeah, great to be back and do another podcast. So. Uh, ready to go it should be a fun one and um what was a very interesting race in Imola it was very much so and uh just quickly before we move on to the race uh Shaker is away for the next uh, little while as he's uh, away in India right now at the moment so uh hello to you Shaker if you are watching from there but uh, we'll have you back on uh, as soon as you're back here in Canada for the next few races but just myself and Tyler flying along for this episode today and like you mentioned there we got a lot to get to because it was a very interesting weekend first sprint weekend of 2022 and we've got a little bit of uh, upcoming race thoughts of, as well on Miami at the end of this episode so stick around there just a quick reminder this podcast is sponsored by the gpbox.com the largest world's largest motorsport marketplace website and we've got exclusive discount codes for you guys backmarkers f1 show podcast listeners all of the information is found in the description below whether you're watching on youtube or listening in your favorite podcast app so now that that's out of the way let's dive right into the events of the 2022 emilia romagna grand prix there tyler and it was a little bit of mixed conditions we had rain we had slick tires we had a little bit of everything but let's start at the beginning of the race we're going to try and go in somewhat of a chronological order here and we had the turn one incident at the tamborello chicane between carlos Sainz and daniel ricardo and i bring this up just because i was curious to get your thoughts on how you saw that incident playing out who was predominantly at fault and do you think that the stewards handled it well in terms of not giving a penalty at the end of the day yeah, that was a, a tricky one for sure, Chris. Uh, you could kind of see it happening. Uh, someone was going to make contact in that turn one, especially with those tricky conditions that we saw, like we saw last year as well. Um, and unfortunately, it was Daniel Ricciardo and Carlos Sainz, uh, two former Red Bull Academy drivers, or Red Bull drivers in general, I should say. Um, but it, for me, uh, really looking at it, I thought it was a racing incident. I thought that no investigation was necessary as well. I think the stewards actually got it right, and we don't say that much on this channel. Um, but I do think they actually got it right. Um, you know, there was you know, not enough room really for both those drivers to, to make that corner. And they were both in there. Um, obviously, Ricardo hit that curb and kind of bounced toward, uh, to, toward Carlos Sainz. But at the same time, there was enough room for if they both, if, if Ricardo doesn't clip that curb, um, you know, I think they both get through their fine. So uh, just an unfortunate incident, a race, uh, pardon me, lap one racing incident for me uh and i think everyone moves on well sucks for carlos science of course uh, especially uh, at one of the italian grand prix races we'll see this year of course they wanted tofosi to uh, be cheering for their their team very loud and and for their, their such a passionate fan organization but i mean uh you know it's 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 too bad for carlos but it should be interesting to see how he does uh, back in monza he'll be looking for redemption in monza uh later in september yeah, I pretty much saw it the same way that you did, that it was just one of those lap one racing incidents that both drivers in the end really suffered from the mistake, obviously. But uh, mm -hmm. I think that it was a good good call there from the stewards to just go with the no penalty. And like you said, I'm glad you mentioned that too. Ricardo hitting that curb on the inside of turn one, really, it was slippery and it kind of launched his car right into Carlos Sainz's. And it was just unlucky, really, for Sainz because of the way that Ricardo hit him and just spun him around and then beached him in the in the gravel. I don't think he had really any damage other than the fact that he got stuck in the gravel trap. And it's funny because you look at, in that same incident, Valtteri Bottas absolutely careered right into the back of Daniel <laughs> Ricciardo and seemingly had no damage. I mean, it seemed like he had a pretty sturdy front wing on that Alfa Romeo. I, I couldn't believe how that front wing stayed on the, the car of Valtteri Bottas. And, um, you know, he really hit Ricciardo with, with a good amount of force as well. And you mentioned the no damage to science. I, you know. For a second, I thought maybe the stewards would push him out of the gravel trap because I know David Croft on the Sky broadcast was talking about that, how uh, the, he could possibly get a push. Yeah. Um, I was, I'm was i not sure what the regulations are behind that. Um, but, I mean, it looked like he could have been fine. So I'm not sure 
I'd like to hear why there wasn't maybe a, he didn't get pushed out of the gravel. Maybe he was too stuck in. The stewards couldn't push him out. He needed a tractor, and that's where the the um, regulations kind of say that, oh, no, you're not allowed. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but it'd be interesting to kind of find that regulation in the uh, in the FIA um, F1 steward just stewardship, <laughs> regular, whatever they want to call it. Yeah, I know it's not like the old days, right, where they could go back to the pits, jump in their spare car, or get a push yeah. from from the marshals. I think the rules are a lot more strict nowadays. So, uh, yeah, it's just unfortunate for science. It was just such an awful Emilia Romagna Grand Prix weekend for him. He obviously had the crash in uh, qualifying, which had him start the sprint race in 10th, had a good sprint race, and then it all really unraveled just there on lap one. So not a good way for him to kick off the new contract with Ferrari, but I'm um, hoping that the luck will kind of turn around for him. And Hopefully he won't be overdriving that Ferrari a little bit too much. And, you know, because car's got a lot of speed in it and Carlos has got a lot of talent as well. So I think that uh, he's more than capable of some of the results than he's shown early on in this season. So let's move from one Ferrari then to the next Ferrari. I know this isn't exactly in chronological order in terms of the race, but we do have to get to the big incident, which really happened at the very last stages of the Grand Prix. And it seemed like, Tyler, okay, we kind of settled into that phase of the race where things were starting to normalize a little bit. We're getting down to the last 15 to 10 laps. It looks like maybe Leclerc is going to catch Perez. Maybe it's going to stay the way that it is. And then I saw it on the onboard. I knew right away that it was going to happen because the way that Leclerc just took the inside curb, that first curb there at, uh, I believe it's the uh, the very anti-alta chicane, as they call it. I was just like, oh man, that's not going to be good. And exactly that. He spun out hit the wall actually, was very lucky to only have a little bit of end plate damage. But what did you think of that mistake from McClaire? Obviously, could have been a lot worse, ended up only losing seven points, but it, it does raise a little bit of an interesting kind of, you know, addition to this championship, right? He looks so flawless from the first four races, and now this little bit of a mistake has opened the door now for uh, Verstappen and uh, Red Bull. So what did you think of, of Leclerc's mistake there in Imola? Yeah, something that he's going to definitely learn from, uh, especially in a championship fight like he's in. Uh, these mistakes are so costly. So, um, yeah, you, like you mentioned, seeing on the onboard, you knew right away that he was taking way too much speed going into that uh, that chicane, and uh, you know, really trying to slow it down by clipping that inside chicane. But in the end, that's what caused him to spin out. So, um, kind of a, a tough one for Charles Leclerc. And I found it really interesting, and maybe we'll touch on this later. But in the post race cool down room. Um, we actually got to hear uh, Max Verstappen, Sergio Perez, and Lando Norris talking to each other, and they replay that Leclerc incident. They knew right away, too. Like, oh, boy, that's a lot of speed <laughs> yeah. points. That, uh, so they knew right away as well what was going to happen. So that was really interesting to kind of hear their perspective of things as well since they're you know in the car going through that exact same chicane. So I thought that was really cool. But um, like you mentioned, uh, going back to the whole championship fight, I mean, every single race that, Max Verstappen has finished. He has won. Um, so, you know, it's been a, an up and down for Max Verstappen. And Charles Leclerc has been consistent up until this point. And that's why he was leading the championship. But, uh, you know, if Red Bull starts to get uh, that consist- consistency, the reliability, um, we, Charles Leclerc is going to have to uh, make sure he doesn't make too many of these mistakes, if not, you know, any. Uh, obviously, mistakes are going to happen. There will be DNFs for Charles. There will be DNFs for, for Max throughout the year. Um, but to try and minimize those as much as he can, I think it's going to be very important for this championship fight that he's in. Absolutely, and we don't have to blow this out of proportion. I mean, it was a, a little mistake, but it is a costly mm-hmm. one, and last year's championship showed that literally every single point counts, and you could go back to the starts of early of 2021 and say, like, okay, this race or that race could have helped either driver clinch the championship. So Leclerc is definitely going to learn from this. It's a good experience for him because in that first three races, he was flawless, didn't really put a foot wrong. But when you look at it, enter the weekend up 46 points, and now he leaves uh, Imola going into Miami only up 27 Now, I say only up 27, that is a very decent points margin as well, but it's certainly not 46 points. So you don't really need to open the door that much for Max Verstappen to really have a go. And the performance of the Red Bulls was just better, I think, this weekend than Ferrari. I mean, the upgrade that they brought was was good. And I think it even, not even the score with Ferrari, but at least they're a little bit closer in terms of performance. And I think the, the more of the headache or the more of the question for Ferrari here is both Red Bulls are looking very strong. Sergio Perez has seemed to up his game this season in 2022. I really think he's driving phenomenally. 
you know, he made a little bit of a mistake when he was defending from Leclerc, but his driving was kind of what really forced Leclerc to, to push that hard. So I think that's kind of the question here, Tyler, is, you know, with Carlos Sainz not performing as well this early in the season and the Red Bulls being at such a high level now, I mean, this is a very interesting dynamic, I think, after this race where we start to think about the championship a little differently than we did after Australia. Absolutely. I, you know, I think Sergio Perez is going to be a multiple race winner this season. Um, you know, he's really shown that he's brought a, you know, a different level of Sergio Perez here this year. And, um, you know, if you talk about teammates, Carlos Sainz, I know we talked about him, you know, just a couple seconds ago, but, you know, that could be the difference in the constructors battle. Uh, Carlos Sainz just hasn't really clicked uh, so far this year just yet. He's, he's made a few mistakes that has cost him, um, especially in those last two races. And, you know, we could really see the constructors battle come down to that as well, whether we see Sergio Perez beating Carlos Sainz. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how Perez does this year. But I, I'm really impressed how far he's come just in this offseason. I mean, we all know Sergio Perez is a fantastic driver. We called it for years on this channel how he should be in a bigger, uh, bigger ride. And especially when it looks like he was out of a ride, you know, we said he, there's no doubt in our mind he should be at Red Bull. And uh, it's really coming out this year. Maybe last year was kind of a feeling out period, but well, is he ever feeling a lot more comfortable this year? And you can tell. 100%. And I believe he's only five points back of Verstappen in the championship. So let's not rule him out as a championship contender as of yet yep. either, right? So he's been driving very consistently, very good. And again, the teamwork between them from day one at Red Bull, but especially this season, has been excellent and just great to see. So yeah, keep an eye out for Sergio Perez as well. But that's why it's important for Leclerc and Ferrari to try and minimize these mistakes because you have both Red Bulls right on their heels looking to capitalize on those points. And that Constructors' Championship you just mentioned, Tyler, now it's only 11 points between the two. So it's all to play for. Very long season ahead of us. But uh, yeah, the events of Imola really made me think a little bit differently about this championship and that it's certainly not over yet. So if you're a Tafosi fan, nothing to panic about, nothing to cause you any major concern, but a good learning experience for Leclerc and the team as well. Just quickly before we move on to the DRS topic of this race, mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your thoughts quickly. Do you think Ferrari made the right call in bringing Leclerc in to try and get that fastest lap point or should they have just left him out, been a little bit more conservative? I think they made the right decision. I think they needed to, to do something different. Um, and I kind of like the um, stack along, not stack along, but chain effect that they uh, ended up doing with, with both Red Bulls pitting. Because the same thing could have happened with both Red Bulls or they both of them could have had it in it, you know, maybe a pit stop that didn't go right. Obviously, the same could have happened for Charles Leclerc, but um, I think it was the right decision personally. Um, you know, every point, like I said, every point is going to matter in this championship. And they had the opportunity to... Uh, try and get that fastest lap point and, and they had it for i believe a second right so um but did they no for stopping got uh the fastest lap did you not yeah that's yeah. right yeah um so it, you know, i still think it's the right call um obviously if charles was pushing harder that's what led to uh the spin but i think he would have been pushing the same amount on the medium tires trying to catch sergio perez so i don't think it comes down to that i think i like the gamble from ferrari Okay, cool. Yeah, I was just curious uh, what your thoughts were. So, yeah, let us know down in the comments below from our listeners what you thought of uh, Leclerc's spin in Imola and whether this kind of changed your perspective on this year's championship. So whether you want to do it now or later on, uh, once you're done watching this episode, comment down below. So then moving on to the one of the issues that we were kind of discussing before we got onto this air here is uh, the DRS issue from the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. And it wasn't too long ago after the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, we were discussing maybe it's time for F1 to scrap DRS. Maybe we need a race in which we don't use DRS to see what it's like. And it's almost as if the FIA used the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix as a trial ground for a no DRS formula because even after the dry conditions but even before then when it was starting to already dry up on the intermediate tires we've seen in many different races them enable drs but the stewards weren't doing it weren't doing it and we saw especially Gasly and hamilton and albon and that train really just stuck behind each other unable to make any overtake so i think after this race it's an excellent question to ask do we actually need drs i mean was this race kind of an example of well you know maybe we do need drs in formula one to just help overtaking a little bit or was it maybe just track specific to this circuit? I think we need it. Um, and I wasn't <laughs> sure. Uh, but I mean, we do see those DRS trains. 
um, that of course don't help anyone, but at least we see them catching the, the driver in front that doesn't have DRS. Um, in these slip sli- slipstream chains, uh, you really didn't see anyone move. And of course, uh, you know, Im- like Imola isn't the greatest for overtaking, um, and, but that's a perfect example of why you, know, you need DRS is to kind of promote that little bit of overtaking that there could be at Imola. So um, we saw DRS maybe be a little overpowered in years past, and we saw how much it kind of uh, lets drivers uh, overtake uh, fairly easily. And we saw some of those easy overtakes uh, in this Grand Prix as well. Um, but I mean, without that DRS, you really didn't, you saw everyone stuck for a little bit, um, which was, you know, not what you wanted to see. So I think DRS is important. I don't know about you, Chris, but I think it needs to stay. Yeah, you know, uh, my sources tell me that uh, Lewis Hamilton is still trying to get past Pierre Gasly uh, as we <laughs> speak. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. I think, uh, unfortunately, at the moment, we still do need DRS because I-, I think that it just helps just that little bit of extra horsepower to either get the move done, you know, under braking. I know that we've seen a lot of DRS moves happen before we even get to the corner, but it was you really just saw it in this race that they weren't able to get that little extra boost to try and at least go for an overtake because the likes of Hamilton, for example, just really never were able to close in and neither was Pierre Gasly on Alex Albon. So I think at the moment we still do need it. Now, if we went to a more overtake friendly circuit, would the need for DRS be as greater? Probably not. But on a circuit like Imola, maybe Barcelona, for example, where overtaking on its own is very difficult, I think we do need DRS. Now, we can discuss about going to certain tracks and whether we need to eliminate some DRS zones. I know coming up in Miami, there's going to be three. Do we need that many? What you know, All those things come into play, but I, I think that it's kind of like a, a necessary evil in Formula 1 at the moment because we just haven't figured out that that overtaking, that racing yet that we could do it without DRS. So I think we still do need it. I would agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I don't know. You, you see IndyCar with their push to pass. I mean, there's those options. Obviously, that was the uh, the curves back in the day. Um, and obviously, that's changed to ERS. So you, you kind of have that deployment of, of ERS. Um, but like you said, it, there has to be some sort of middle ground. I mean, we'll talk about Miami in a little bit, but um, the three DRS zones, uh, like you said, that might be a little too aggressive. So it's going to be interesting to see because you'll have a full on um, no DRS race to three <laughs> DRS zones race back to back and we can kind of get a good judge. And I think most people are going to settle with somewhere in the middle uh, that we're uh, of where we should be. And we've had those two DRS zones for years and years. And all of a sudden it was last year, they started at three and um, you know, I'm, I'm just not sure how it's going to be, but it'll be, Interesting to see how how Miami races with uh, the three DRS zones. Yeah, we'll see what that's going to be like. So, yeah, let us know what you guys think if DRS is still a necessary evil in Formula 1 or can we do the sport without it? So, uh, I know Imola is a very specific track. It's old school. It's narrow, difficult to overtake, so probably not the best representation. But maybe maybe some viewers out there have some different outlooks on it. So, please uh, let us know what you guys think on the DRS issue. So... Moving on then, uh, let's talk about Lando Norris because McLaren really, really had an excellent recovery weekend from the first few races of 2022. I know with Ricardo, he had his incident that saw him tumble down the order. But regardless, Lando Norris, he loves these types of conditions. Intermediates going on to hards, or excuse me, going on to slicks. He loves these types of conditions. Second straight podium in Imola. And it's just nice to see that I think that McLaren, maybe the worst days are behind them and maybe Bahrain and Saudi was just an anomaly and that they actually do have a better car than what they showed early this year. Yeah, and I think it kind of even took Daniel Ricciardo by surprise. Uh, I don't know if you listened to his team radio when he crossed the line, Chris, but uh, you know, his engineer was naming off, okay, so Max first, Sergio second, Lando third, and they going fourth, fifth, sixth. And he goes, did you say Lando third? <laughs> and he was, he, he was kind of taken aback, and you could tell the disappointment in Ricciardo's voice um, of how his race went. Now this engineer also did say that they had pretty big diffuser damage um, that made them pretty slow and that they're, you know, that they went on the hard compound tires, which really did not work for them. That was a a pretty poor um, strategic decision by McLaren. So a tough race for Daniel, but I mean, complete other end of the spectrum for, for Lando, a fantastic on that side of the garage, Um, you know, another podium. And he kind of mentioned that it was like very similar to last year's race, uh, where he got a podium as well. So kind of deja vu for Lando. 
great to see McLaren back on the podium. Uh, obviously, they were there a lot last year. We were worried at the start of this year whether or not we'd see them on the podium at all this season. But uh, in race four, uh, they already have – or race – where are we now? Race five? Race four? Race four, yeah. <laughs> I'm losing track already. There's too many races this year. Um, uh, so it's great to see them back uh, on the podium. And that, who knows if this is a Kickstarter for McLaren. Uh, it's definitely going to boost a lot of the morale in the in the factory and in the garage, uh, especially on the land and north side of the garage, but uh, something that they can use as motivation going for races in the future. And I think Daniel is going to love Miami late breaking. A um, lot of lot of late breaking at, at Miami as we'll get to see it in a few a few mo- minutes time, uh, but it could be a, a nice track for Daniel Ricardo. And I think McLaren are certainly not where they want to be because they expected to at least be breaking into the very top of F one, considering the last few years that they've had. Mm-hmm. But it is good to see that there's good potential in that car, at least on Lando Norris's side. We'll wait and see what Daniel Ricardo can give us, but. I just think Norris, he always loves that these types of conditions, he loves to be able to battle the guys at the front. And regardless that he got a little bit lucky with obviously Leclerc spin and everything, but he was right there on merit from the sprint race to then the full Grand Prix as well. He was going to finish at worst in fourth place. So lucked out a little bit in the end, but totally deserved. And I'm going to be interested to see where McLaren can go from here because the battle outside of Ferrari and Red Bull is just totally up for grabs here. And as we move on a little bit down the field, I mean, you talk a look, you take a look at some of the drivers who had some fantastic races. We throw in Valtteri Bottas for Alfa Romeo, finishing in fifth. George Russell, even for Mercedes, in a fourth place, a very well-driven race. And then just further down, I mean, you had both Aston Martin scoring points. The Alpines are still in play, you know, despite the bad luck there for Fernando Alonso. So I really think that when you look at that best of the rest, you could say it's totally up for grabs. Even that third place, it could be Alfa Romeo, it could be McLaren if they're resurging. It could be Alpine who've shown themselves to be really, really good. So what do you think of that midfield battle there, Tyler? I mean... Imola was just kind of an all-over-the-place race with drivers dropping out and tire changes and everything. But I think that, to me, the standouts there were were certainly Alfa Romeo uh, with Valtteri Bottas finishing in fifth. I thought he had a very impressive race. Uh, It was one of the best races in Valtteri Bottas' career, I think. Um, Phenomenal job by Valtteri. Uh, to, to finish P5. They had a little celebration for him after in the Alfa Romeo garage. I saw that, yeah. Cool see. yeah. Yeah, so that was awesome uh, to, to kind of and uh, you know, Valtteri deserved that. And he's been absolutely blowing uh, Zhao Guan Yu out of the water so far this season. And that has nothing against Zhao Guan Yu. Um, I think he's a, a phenomenal race driver as well. He's going to be, you know, a, a mainstay in Formula One for years to come. Um, but it shows you the experience level and, uh, you know, the kind of, um, I want to say, you know, with, with Valtteri being at Mercedes for, you know, such a, you know, four or five years, He's learned a lot of little tricks here and there, and it's really given you know, having the battle, Lewis. You can see the talent that Valtteri Bottas has, and I think that was kind of underappreciated, um, in, you know, being in the shadow of Lewis for all these years, eh? and it's really coming out now this year. I think it's awesome for Valtteri. He just definitely deserves it, um, and he's going to teach a lot to Joe Guan Yu as well. I think that's a, a perfect partnership at Alfa Romeo right now. We'll see how long Valtteri stays at, you know, at Alfa Romeo. To, you know. If, Maybe another big team takes another swipe at him with, with the amount of form that he's been having as well. So something to keep in mind, um, but you know, awesome to see for Alfa Romeo. That midfield battle is, is all over the place. Who knows where it's going to end up at the end of the year. I mean, um, we saw a nice little resurgence from Aston Martin you know, this week, which was nice. You know, I know both those drivers love the mixed conditions and are very good in the mixed conditions and battle and stroll. But you know, there's a team with... Um, you know, a lot of great minds behind it. They just have to figure out the car. Once they figure out that car, I think that they're going to be up there as well. So it's going to be really interesting Interesting to see how it plays out. I have no idea who's going to be third, who's going to be fourth, who's going to be fifth. At the start of the year, of course, we gave our predictions. I had Alfa Romeo finishing last, and that looks silly <laughs> now, doesn't it? Uh, so um, I think it's all over the place. Which is awesome because yeah. we're going to get to see a lot of surprises this year. And there's a lot of great racing going on in that midfield at the moment. And I think that a team like Alfa Romeo, you mentioned McLaren getting multiple podiums this year. I think Alfa Romeo will also be able to get uh, a bunch of podiums this year. Because had Valtteri not had the slow pit stop, I think that podium could have been his. I think the race pace of the Alfa 
was quicker than the McLaren. I think that he could have gotten him, although one of the weaknesses of Bottas that we've seen in this race and in the first few races this year has always been his ability to overtake. Now, I know this circuit is difficult to overtake, but I think that maybe he could have been a little bit more aggressive there on George Russell. But then again, we know what happens when he races George Russell. So <laughs> I think it was yeah. smart. And that was definitely a factor, too, with the whole DRS not being activated as well. Of course, that right. massive accident that they had last year with DRS being activated and that wet line still being there. Uh, we saw that how big of an accident they, they had. So uh, that's another reason why you didn't see DRS activated um, by the, the stewards. But yeah, that, we've said that about Valtteri for years as well, uh, how um, he just needs to be more aggressive overtaking. And it's just one of the flaws that he has. And um, something that has haunted him uh, at Mercedes. And it's something that um, I think everyone has has said about Valtteri. Um, but even, again, as I said, you see the amount of talent that this driver has. It's through the roof. And uh, yeah, that would have been pretty cool for him to get a podium. Uh, but like you said, I think a podium for Valtteri is not out of the question for this season. Yeah, not at all. So I'm excited to see what they can do. And also just a quick... Uh, mention on Zhou Guan Yu as well. I mean, difficult weekend, obviously not all his fault. I think just some racing incidents that were getting yeah. in his way. But I think he's had a very, very great start to 2022. Yep. He's really impressed me. And I think a lot of people uh, are kind of putting a lot of praise on him and how he's handled his rookie year so far. So I think a lot of potential to come from his side of the garage as well. Now, two more drivers that I wanted to just mention in the midfield before we talk a little bit about uh, Hamilton and Mercedes and then some Miami Grand Prix talk is Yuki Tsunoda finishing in seventh place there for Alpha Tauri. Home race for Alpha Tauri, of course, their factory just really down the road from Imola. But we've seen a almost completely different Yuki this season. So calm on the team radio, very positive, working very hard. Not that he didn't before, but working extra hard with his team. And it's been a struggle this year for them in terms of car performance, but he really did a great job. And I think he's been doing a solid job this season. And Gasly struggling, of course, was stuck behind the Williams of Alex Albon, the second midfield driver there I want to give a shout out to because I think <laughs> Albon's been having some tremendous races and could have been in the points once again had it not been for, you know, a little bit of luck goes his way. And, and like he said, post-race, if they find a few more tents in that car, they could really be possibly even scoring points on the regular. So those two drivers just wanted to make a quick mention because I thought they had great races. Absolutely. I mean, I think I was one of Yuki's biggest critics last year. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was, I was all over him last year, but I will eat my words for this year. He's really, really impressed me this year as well, Chris. And I think that uh, he's shown a lot more mature of a driver. Um, like you mentioned, a lot more calm and he's really got a good handle of that uh, Alpha Tauri. Uh, you know, he's, he's showing the potential that Yuki has. So I'm really excited to see what he does this year. And I hope that, you know, he gets um, a couple top five uh, positions this year. It's going to be tough, like you, as you mentioned, with that Alpha Tower. Not really up to spec exactly where they want it to be. Um, but it's definitely possible. Uh, you know, he's he's really shown how good of a driver he is. And for the Williams as well, it's a tough race for, for Nicky Latifi again, unfortunately. Um, you know, I hope to see his fortunes turn around just as a Canadian. And of course, this being a Canadian podcast, we want to see our Canadians do well. Um, but Alex Albon had another very good race. I don't know if he was, if they would have got points. I think they, you know, they're lucky it wasn't a hard, um, hard circuit to overtake at because I think they could have lost, Albon could have lost a, a few more positions as well. Um, I don't think the pace is there in the Williams just yet. Uh, they need maybe five tenths, I'd say, if they want to uh, score yeah. regular points. It, it's maybe not a few, but several tenths. <laughs> um, but you know, I hope that they do because uh, what, both those drivers, we want to see do well. They're both very good guys. So I uh, want to see them perform and, and score points on the regular. And just on the topic of points, before I forget, I wanted to mention that I believe it's the first time ever in F1 history that all teams have scored points in the first four races of the year. Wow. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. It's true. Yeah, with uh, obviously with Alpha, or Alpha Aston Martin. Um, scoring a double points finish there this weekend. So, yeah, really interesting stat. That's, that's a cool one. Yeah, so whether that's a result of the new regulations or just how everything played out in the first four races, we'll leave that up to you. But, uh, yeah, it was very awesome to see all teams already scoring points. But, uh, yeah, so just to quickly, before we move on to Mercedes, I wanted to just <laughs> throw this out there because it was something I saw scrolling through F1 Twitter yesterday. Uh, I believe this came from a Spanish journalist or an analyst, but... 
pretty credited gentleman, so he, you know, just not kind of a, a BS rumor, but apparently that there might be a chance of a driver swap this season going on. And um, just from the comments, most people think that it might involve Nicholas Latifi. It might even be a Schumacher Latifi swap. It might be a Latifi Oscar Piastri swap. Just some pretty uh, crazy rumors going around. But apparently, there's some uh, th- there's some pretty credence to these rumors, or otherwise he wouldn't be putting it out there. But there's a rumor about 2023 for sure. But there could put even possibility of it happening this season. Well, I hope for for Nicky's sake uh, he stays in F1 because. I think he's had a lot of bad luck with the cars that he's had. Um, We've seen in F2 how good of a driver he is. Um, And unfortunately, the Williams just hasn't had the pace. Um, And you need that car behind you. I mean, look at Lewis Hamilton. He doesn't have the car behind him this year. You know, we don't see Lewis being Lewis. Um, Not comparing Latifi to Lewis, but I mean, (laughs) you know, they, you you can see how much a car kind of provides um, these drivers with the opportunity to do well. So, um, yeah, I hope Latifi stays in F1, especially at least until the Canadian Grand Prix. I mean, poor guy has been in F1 for three years and hasn't had a, a home GP. So uh, we want to see him do well. Um, we've had a, had him on this channel before for multiple interviews. He's a great guy and deserves to have an F1 seat, in my opinion. Yeah, I hope it's not him as well. And, and like I said, I'm just putting it out there because it was something really interesting and out of nowhere that I didn't expect to, to be hearing about. But even if it is a swap, I hope that he at least stays in F1 and is on one of the teams so uh yeah just putting that rumor out there but uh, if you guys hear anything let us know uh in the comments section all right so moving on the last one for me on my end before we move on to uh, some miami talk is uh, just <laughs> lewis hamilton's really awful weekend i mean we even saw him almost uh you know getting into sort of sort of a heated exchange with total wolf I, you know don't read anything into that guys this isn't some ridiculous blow up and he's going to be asking for a, a release or whatever no it's just you know two guys in a working environment two champions who aren't happy with the situation that they're in and just a really tough race all i'm going to say is you can summarize hamilton's race by the fact that he was lapped by the guy he fought the championship for last season mm-hmm. max verstappen yeah, it, it's a really tough race for Lewis. And that must have been hard to see Max go by and lap him. I couldn't imagine. It especially must have been tough to see his teammate, George Russell, up so high yeah, in the points position, um, finishing in uh, in fourth place, pardon me. Um, so, you know, another great drive from George. But, yeah, uh, you saw Total Wolf as well um, go on the radio after the race and, and apologize to Lewis for the car. You know, I think that's... Um, I don't think Toto has to apologize. Um, I, I think that's more of a um, try to keep the morale um, up on Lewis's side. And, you know, Lewis is such a has uh, you know a lot of positivity always on the radio and, and is you know trying to get his team to work harder and and push through things. Um, but you really saw a, a dejected Lewis this weekend uh, for the first time in a long time. And Nico Rosberg touched on this, and he said that you know you don't you don't see Lewis like this often. Um, and that, you know, this, you know, to have, that's not the Lewis that you want. You need him to stay motivated throughout the whole season, uh, which is true. I mean, if you've won seven world championships, it'd be pretty hard to stay motivated, you know, racing in the midfield every single weekend. I mean, that'd be really, really tough. So hopefully for Lewis's sake, they, um, can find something going on with that car and, and boost performance, but, uh, just another tough weekend for Lewis. Um, and you know, it, there's a lot of people saying, well, you know, is Lewis actually worth a seven time uh, champion? Like, come on. I mean, you're, you're talking about one of the greatest drivers of all time. Um, easy with the, uh, you know, he's just because he's having a, a, a bad start to the season, um, they know that he's you know, washed up and doesn't deserve a seven titles. I've seen that on Twitter. It's absolutely ridiculous. Um, he's one of the greatest of all time. Put some respect on Lewis Hamilton's name. Well, it's just all about timing, right, in the sport as well. But, I mean, if he wasn't one of the greatest, then Valtteri Bottas would have been able to win a few world championships already in that time frame, right? And Nico Rosberg would have had more than one. So, uh, yeah, no, I I don't think it's that. I I just think that, you know, it's interesting with the car versus driver debate, right? But we Mm -hmm. do see that, yes, in Formula One, it is very dependent on the car that you have. And... um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that he's still, uh, you know, obviously a very capable world championship driver. But it's just a very difficult car to drive at the moment. I mean, even both drivers complaining that physically it's just difficult with the amount of porpoising issues that they have. You know, they're getting back pains and chest pain. So very difficult car to drive. And like you, just speaking on your motivation point, it must be even harder for him considering how last year ended with the championship. Yeah. You know, 
it would, this would have been great if he would have been able to fight for another one, but now it's going to maybe compound all those emotions if, you know, he brings those emotions back, which I don't think that he does. But yeah, it's going to be a very long year for them. The hope is, and I think the positive thing for them is that if they can figure out the bouncing issues on that W13, they do have a pretty solid car underneath them. And I think that they're capable of at least, you know, by mid-season, maybe by the end of the season, being able to fight for a win here or there. That's the hope. But I think he's right. Hamilton is in his assessment that the championship is probably not in the horizon for them this season. But uh, it'll be interesting how the battle between the two teammates, you know, comes out because George Russell as well, the only driver this season to finish in the top five in all four races. So uh, he's been going from Mr. Saturday to Mr. Consistent now, (laughs) but uh, a good start for him at life at Mercedes. So yeah, it was just a, a pretty crazy visual to see, you know, Verstappen lapping Hamilton there just goes to show how much they are truly struggling. So if uh, you don't have anything else on uh, the Imola Grand Prix, we can move on to Miami. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Yeah, yeah, same here on my end. So uh, let us know your thoughts on the race down below, and uh, we'll wrap up this podcast in another 5-10 minutes or so just talking about the next race, the Miami Grand Prix. And we want to talk about it because it's a totally brand new circuit to Formula 1. And uh, within the next few days, you should be seeing a uh, separate circuit guide video for that. Um, just because a lot of people out there don't know this crack, don't know the track. Even I don't even really know the track, and I'm still learning it now as we speak. But I think it's a really interesting circuit, and it's got the potential to be a decent race. I think it's got the typical problems of a street track. It's narrow. There aren't very many overtaking opportunities. But in terms of the venue and in terms of the city, I mean, it's going to be a pretty spectacular spectacle, and that's kind of what they're trying to do here with the Miami Grand Prix. But what are your thoughts uh, on the circuit, on the venue itself, and just the overall Miami Grand Prix coming up soon? Yeah, the, the big selling point, Yacht City. Yacht City. <laughs> Someone's got to make a song about Yacht City. Uh, they're trying to outdo Monaco with the amount of yachts that are going to be on the coast. I don't know. I, just, I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the, as for the actual track, I'm looking at it now. I mean, 17 turns, uh, that's a lot. It's 19 turns. Um, 19 turns, uh, you know, it looks like it should be an interesting racetrack. I, I don't know how it's going to race exactly. Um, you know, your first sector is a lot of sweeping S's. Uh, definitely not a lot of overtaking opportunities there. You got a, a long, long back straight with a couple of bends in there. But sector three is what really interests me. There's a, uh, you know, it, it interests me in a way, I should say, because you have two very hard breaking spots in turn 11 and turn 17 after long straights where straights where you can see a lot of overtaking, but you also have this really clunky turn 12, 13, 14, 15, and I guess you can include 16 a little bit on that as well. That kind of reminds me of, uh, of Abu Dhabi, kind of reminds me of uh, Russia, where it's just flat short you know not very high speed uh sharp turns and then they go into another back main straight so i, I don't know how that sector is going to take place i mean i'm just looking at the um, you know the, this the whole circuit in general that's definitely gonna be the slowest part of the circuit um, but then you go back on another long back straight away um which leads to another hard breaking area so i really like the last three turns i think it looks really really cool um and you'll see um on the circuit guide uh, that Chris will be putting out, so we'll we'll take you around a lap of uh, of Miami. You'll you'll understand that as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it races. Um, but you know, I hope that it's going to be a, a very solid race. Um, it's going to be I don't know it, 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 with the new circuit, you never know exactly how it's going to end up. Um, but it definitely has potential, but also has potential to be an absolute stinker. So uh, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> As with all new circuits nowadays, right? It's yeah. like, I'm hoping that this year's cars, the new regulations will make it more exciting than if it would have debuted a few years ago. Mm. But um, yeah, I have a lot of question marks about it as well because just by looking at it like you were just doing right now and I've got it here too, yeah, overtaking is going to be difficult. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you know, I think the three DRS ones will be pretty powerful, so we should see some moves going into that turn 17 hairpin just at the end of the lap there. Now, the circuit has a little bit of elevation change to it um, going into the uh, little chicane or or the hairpin, whatever. I think it's uh, turns 14 
Uh, so it kind of there's a an a uphill approach and then you go kind of downhill on the exit of the corner which you won't really see on the onboards but if you have any offboard laps you'll be able to actually see there is a little bit of a of a dip there uh, you know nothing major but at the end of the day it's still a little bit of something so other than that though the track surface is extremely smooth very 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 flat uh, typical obviously of a new circuit so that's that's one thing to keep in mind I love the first sector, actually, just some of those high-speed mm. corners going through four and eight. There's some really good kind of uh, corner combinations there and change of, changes of directions. Um, now, through turn nine and ten, I think just as you're passing on the right-hand side is the sort of the Miami tennis complex there. The organizers say there is a possibility of cars side-by-side side and a potential to overtake going into the uh, turn 11 braking zone. So, like I said, there is possibilities here. I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. It's like either going to be okay. This has ended up pretty a good, pretty good race, but it also could just be an awful race as well because there are very many corners that remind me of that old Abu Dhabi layout, which gives me the shudders thinking about it. But um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see, right? I mean, we're only a few weeks away, but I think the real selling point of this is, you know, Miami, the city itself, right? The the party atmosphere that they're going to have the Monaco of, uh, of of Florida, I guess, if you want to call it. So that's that's the main selling point. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, um, Florida in general, um, Florida, and especially Miami, is known for uh, very random pop-up showers. Um, <laughs> it is, yeah, all of a sudden, you could have you know, tons of rain, tons of rain. And I, I'm just looking at the 14-day forecast for Miami, Chris, um wow this could get interesting um <laughs> you have 40 percent chance of rain on the friday 30 degrees celsius uh, on saturday 80 percent of showers 10 to 15 millimeters of rain which is well, that's a lot of rain it's gonna be it's very wet out there uh high of 31 degrees celsius and like i mentioned 80 percent chance of rain so qualifying could be in the rain and sunday for the actual race, 80% chance of rain as well, around five millimeters, and it's going to be 31 degrees. So it's going to be hot, muggy, rainy, tons of humidity in the air. Classic, classic Florida weather. Uh, we're going to have lots of sun, and then all of a sudden you're going to have a downpour. Um, and that's what is going to be really interesting in this race. Uh, a lot of uh, just us being from Canada, um, you know, we traveled to Florida for the, you know, some of the winter, you know, we take a little bit of trip in, in, in the summer sun or the, actually, the winter sun, uh, but still warm down in Florida. And you see these pop-up showers all the time. So, um, yeah, that's going to be really interesting, uh, to see if you know, who knows what the weather's going to be. And no one knows in Florida, in Florida what the weather's going to be on an hourly basis. So it's uh, going to be interesting. Yeah, good point there, and and it sure is going to be a, a fun, fun little weekend. I think uh, going to Miami first race this season in the U.S. first of two, obviously, and then in 2023 it will be uh, three races in the U.S.A. So uh, it should be a very interesting venue, brand new to the sport, and uh, like you guys, we're going to be learning right alongside with you. So once that circuit guide is out, uh, we'll be interested to hear what you guys have to say about the circuit, but also let us know in this video as well and in this podcast what you think of the new. Miami Grand Prix track. It is the very next race coming up, guys. It is uh, race number five of 23 this season. And uh, yeah, should be a, a very good one as well. That should about do it, I think, for uh, episode 130. Tyler, I'll leave uh, the final word to you here. And uh, anything else that you wanted to talk about? Uh, no, that should be pretty much it for me. Um, it's going to be uh, an interesting next few races as well. Of course, uh, Miami, then we go um, to uh, Spain, I believe um for another barcelona classic uh and then monaco so uh some interesting races coming up of course the classic monaco at the end of the month um but uh, lots of uh, good exciting racing coming in the future for formula one yeah and the championship is heating up really nicely just as we get into uh, these interesting races as well so we should have plenty of great uh, things to look forward to and plenty of great content as well that you should be keeping an eye out for of course all of our social media links found in the description down below our sponsor as well the gp box discount links can be found there as well any news updates from us or any other information that you guys like to know about our channel you can visit our website tbmf1show.com or you could just reach out to us uh, on Twitter, probably the best place to uh, be able to talk to us directly. Okay, that'll do it then for this episode, guys, of the podcast. Really appreciate you guys watching or listening. 
Subscribe to our channel on YouTube if you haven't already done so. Click that follow on that uh, podcast app so you never miss a new episode of this podcast. And Tyler and myself will be back after the Miami Grand Prix to break down all the action. Tyler, again, thank you for your company. Thank you guys as well at home, and we'll see you next time. Cool, man.